In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. You have scary stairs here. And so I am not taking extra trips up and down the scary stairs. I just wanted to start with explanation. Today we have a gospel lesson that if you took the 10 most known gospel lessons, this would be one of them. Would you agree? If I were to say, tell me the story of the Good Samaritan, even before you heard it this morning, I bet almost everyone here could somehow paraphrase it and come up with what this story is about. It's an amazing story. It's, first of all, we have to remember it's a parable. And, and parables are confusing sometimes because there are stories about Jesus spent time and had dinner with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. That is something that happened. But a parable is how Jesus uses a story to tell his teaching. It's a teaching tool. And you always recognize parables because they start with something like, well, there was a certain man. He doesn't have a name. He doesn't have a city. He doesn't have much of anything. He just shows up in the story. And so we have this parable. It's a, a wonderful parable because it starts with a lawyer. And I used to be a lawyer. And so I can identify with this lawyer. And the lawyer says to Jesus, what do I have to do to please God, to have eternal life? And Jesus says, well, tell me what you have to do. And the lawyer just smooth-tongued replies, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your strength and with all your soul, oh, and your neighbor as yourself. Now, that's an impressive response, isn't it? Except that every good Jew knew that answer. That you shall love the Lord your God, is called the Shema, or hear, the verb in Hebrew for hear. So hear, O Israel, Shema Israel, you shall love the Lord your God. And it is said every single day as part of the prayers. And so, of course, he's going to know it. If I were to say, now let us pray the prayer that our Lord taught us, you'd all come up with the Lord's Prayer, wouldn't you? either in the old form or the new form or a combination of the two, but you have the answer. So the the lawyer is not impressive with his answer. And so he wants to go a little bit deeper. And the story says that he wanted to justify himself. Uh, He wanted to look good. And so he says, well, who is my neighbor? And whenever I hear that question, I start singing from Mr. Rogers, won't you be my neighbor? It's actually a good response. Who is my neighbor? And Jesus turns it upside down. It's so like Jesus to do that. He doesn't say, who is your neighbor? Whom are you supposed to be loving? Whom are you supposed to be showing mercy to? Instead, he describes what it means to be a good neighbor. He describes the Samaritan, not the man in the ditch. And then says, go and do likewise. And we can all say, oh yeah, we remember the Good Samaritan, and we, it's a good story, and I can know who my neighbor is. But go and do likewise is not always the easiest thing. So I want to share with you what happened to me a month ago. A month ago, I uh, flew to Fort Lauderdale for a business meeting, and I picked up my suitcase from the carousel and my backpack, I started walking to the line of cars that were Lyft drivers, 
And on my way, I missed a step, and I fell. And I fell, and I hit my head and my face and my elbow and my shoulder and my knee. And the most amazing thing happened. I'm one of these people that if I get hurt, I'm an independent person. and I'll be fine. I'll just brush myself off and get in that car and go to the hotel. But that's not what happened. I realized I couldn't move. I couldn't get up. And eight people, I counted them, eight people came to me from various parts of, as they were heading on their busy way with their suitcases and backpacks and helped me. They were amazing. They brought me, uh, they helped me up, they took me to a bench, they brought me towels, they brought me water, they brought me uh, hope, they called 911. A Lyft driver jumped out of his car and ran with a bottle of water to help me. I mean, they stayed with me. And they stayed with, and I kept saying, go, you must have some place to be, I'll be fine. I would not have been. But I was convinced I would be. And until the 911 ambulance showed up and rushed me to the hospital, they stayed with me. I don't know who they are. I don't have names. I want to thank every one of them. But they were good Samaritans, weren't they? And they helped me through a time where I am so convinced I can help myself. But sometimes being helped by a good Samaritan teaches us something as well, how to receive help. In the story of the Good Samaritan, there's this wonderful uh, expression where the Samaritan pours oil and wine on the wounds of the man in the ditch. And I, I've read that many, many times and thought, funny, would you pour oil and wine on someone's wounds? I mean, a little iodine or some antibiotic lotion or something, but oil and wine. But it's a wonderful place in scripture where the word for mercy, we say kyrie eleison, yes? The Greek words for Lord have mercy. The word eleison is the same word as olive oil in that time of, of Greek. And so when we say, Lord, have mercy, we're saying, pour your healing oil and heal us, make us whole. And now, I, when I think of God's mercy and the mercy of others, I think of that oil poured upon us with overflowing for healing. And that's what the Samaritan did. Well, I could stop the story right now and say, go and do likewise. Or I could keep focusing on me and saying, I'm fine. I'm having trouble with labor and industries department, but I'll be fine. But I'm not going to go there. Instead, I want to go a little deeper in the story of the Good Samaritan. Because the Samaritan obviously is an outsider. Jesus talks about a Samaritan because Samaritans can't be good guys. They, they have the gospel wrong. They don't understand. But it's the, the not good guy who becomes the good guy. But now let's look at the man in the ditch. And I have to say that I am, um, I am, I shower every day. I am, um, a, I'm a pretty easy person to take care of if someone needs to bring me help. But what if the person in the ditch is one of the other people, the people we might not want to take care of? What if that person is a homeless person? St. Dunstan's, where I normally hang my hat, has a homeless encampment about four months out of the year. And they live in tents, and there are no showers. And laundry is an issue. And drugs and alcohol can be an issue. What if the person is of a color 
that we don't want to deal with, or of a social status we don't want to deal with. When I was hurt, I, I'm on blood thinners, so I was bleeding profusely. Do you remember the days when if someone was bleeding, we wouldn't touch them because they might have AIDS and we might get sick? The other. Jesus in the story of the Good Samaritan doesn't say, go be a good neighbor to the nice woman lying in the ditch who showered this morning. He says simply, be the neighbor. Go home. Do likewise. Go out there. And that's the call to us. I, I love, you have a sign out front that says, not black lives matter, but black lives are sacred, are holy, are set apart. Wow! When we're neighbors, we can be taken care of as God himself. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 40, there, it, at the long, long verses of Scripture where Jesus says, is, go out there and feed the hungry, clothe the naked, house the homeless, uh, visit the imprisoned and the sick. And as much as you do these things, you do them as unto me. We are serving Jesus himself when we are the good Samaritan. I am going to try to make technology work for a moment. It's going to work. It's a rare event. A friend of mine sent this this morning. It is a prayer inspired by the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I like the prayer. So let us end this sermon with this prayer. God of love. Give us a deep love for you so that we can see the world as you see it, feel the com compassion you feel, and be a people whose lives mediate your love to others. So open our eyes that we might see what the Good Samaritan saw. Grant us the insight to see the need in others, the wisdom to know what to do, and the will to do it. And so we pray for all those who in many and various ways have been stripped, beaten, and left for dead. We pray for children who must grow up in the most awful of circumstances, especially for those starved of love or food or shelter or security. May they receive the future you have planned for them. We pray for those we might cross the road to avoid who have been excluded socially because of their race, their financial status, or their history. May the dignity that is theirs be restored to them. We pray for those whose need we would rather not face up to because it requires action of us, those who suffer atrocities because of war, unjust trade rules, or oppressive governments. May the world receive a true picture of their suffering and the factors that cause it, that justice may be done. Open our eyes that we might not cross the road from human need. Give us a deep love for you, that we may see your love at work in this world, and that we might go and do likewise. Amen.